doing it. And the first thing he said was, she didn't listen to me. I told her not to do it. And I said, okay, all right. Um, but, uh, you know, we're going to be studying the family this morning. So that's a good intro right there. Um, but uh, anyway, seriously, pray for her. Um, that's it's kind of a big deal. It's a big fall. Um, and uh, I'm sure that the prayers are appreciated. Uh, some of you have gone to visit. Uh, that's appreciated. I know the trots are going to visit maybe today. I don't know. You guys can get with them and, you know, get with Brother uh, Paul about that. Um, but uh, uh, that said, prayers. And uh, if you need, uh, want to visit, um, you can get uh, their phone number. Uh, he's got the cell phone. It's in the church directory. If you need that and you don't have it, yes, ma'am. All right, all right, fun stuff, all right, breaking bones and pink eye, great way to start church, all right, yeah. but we're here, amen, so that's what matters, um, all right, uh, that said, let's go ahead and open our Bibles, um, we are continuing our study on uh, no place like home, and that's really what we want our homes to be, is a place like no other, uh, go to Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5, and just by way of review, there are five R's that we're looking at during the course of this study. Five uh, R's, five points, if you will, that start with the letter R. And I uh, want to say I'm really glad to have the young people here this morning for this, because uh, this is important stuff that I think, uh, you know, you may say, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a parent, I'm not a husband, I'm not a wife. Well, someday you probably will be. Uh, the course of nature is that's usually how that thing goes. Very... Very few people have the gift of being single for the Lord, all right? Some people are, some people are single because, you know, no one likes them. Hey, that's not a gift from the Lord, okay? All right? That, that's just you. You're weird. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, uh, but seriously, though, having that gift is a special thing that, that most people don't have. Uh, if you have it, praise the Lord. I mean, God can really use that thing. Matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it talks about serving the Lord without distraction. I'll say this. For every one of the young people that's here this morning, that's where you're at. You are technically a, a single young person growing up, and as such, you can serve the Lord without distraction. That's why it's so important not to, I'm dating so-and-so, you're 13. You don't need to do that, right? Yeah, I like so-and-so. Well, he doesn't even know you exist yet, you know, or vice versa. Um, the, 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 the reason that's important to keep that, that stuff out is because you're at a place in life where you have, you have for a few years, you have that gift, and eventually that's going to change in your life. And that's part of nature. That's how God designed it. That's fine. It's good. Uh, but it's important to get this stuff now versus find out from experience when things don't work out. Amen? So uh, five different R's. We talked about respect. All right, ladies, we learned about subjection. Guys, we talked about honor. We talked about remembrance, uh, honoring the, 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 the uh, biblical authorities and the authority of the Word of God, number one. The Bible needs to be the final authority in your home. Let me say this. The Bible is the final authority in this church. Yes, God has put me here as a pastor, as a head of this church, but ultimately, if I say something that's against that book, not against your preferences, but against that book, all right? You throw me out, you take the Bible. That's how that's supposed to go, all right? You say, what is that? That's remembering biblical authority. And I would say this, I'd say secondly, second to the Bible, uh, leadership in a church is important for you to understand that that is something you ought to follow as a family. And I, I can tell you, I've seen the repercussions, and I've seen the fruit of people basically saying one thing at church, and oh, pastor, it's so good to see you. We love the message, and on the way home, you know what, I think that, you know, I get what he was saying, but I don't know that it has to be that way. And, and you know, you have those conversations with your wife, and especially in front of the kids, that can do a lot of damage. Um, so again, it's important to have respect in the home. Secondly, all right, it's important to have uh, reliance on the Holy Spirit. Reliance on the Holy Spirit. You say, what do you mean by that? We're going to dig into that. Look at Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5, um, your, your home should be a spirit-filled home, all right? Your family should be, a, your, your home unit should be a place where the Spirit of God has free course. The idea of checking the clock in when you come to church, and okay, now we're spiritual Christians, and then checking out, and then going home, and, and the Spirit of God is really, I understand once you're saved, we're going to talk about this, once you're saved, He never leaves you. But man, there are some places where you just sense the, the presence of God more, and there are some places where that is less the case. And I would say that uh, as, as Bible-believing Christians, what we ought to desire is to have a home that is filled with the Spirit of God and to rely 
on the Holy Spirit of God. You ought to be led by the Lord in your decisions. That should be evident in your home. Uh, look at Ephesians chapter number 5, and let's, let's read this verse together. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 18. You guys ready? Ephesians 5, verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is... Are you guys there? All right, about half of you are there. Let's try it again. Ready? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. All right, now a couple of things I'll say before I jump into this. Number one, isn't it nice that we could all read the same words? Amen. <laughs> you know, uh, I'll, I'll move on from that, but I'll just say it's nice to have a church that believes in one book. Um, secondly, notice that there's a contrast. I talked to the young people this week about this. There's a contrast between being drunk and being filled with the Spirit of God. So I'm going to explain what filled with the Spirit of God means. We're going to go through some doctrinal things, and I'm going to get to some practical things in a moment. But the, the doctrine is important so you get the practical right. People say all the time, doctrinal is not important. Doctrine is important. It helps you get the practice right. He, here's what I mean by that. There are some people that believe that being filled with the Spirit of God means you roll, uh, uh, roll around on the ground, you foam at the mouth, you, you say stuff that nobody can understand, and you lose control of your body. And in some people's minds, that is being filled with the Spirit of God. Guys, that is the opposite of being filled with the Spirit of God. You say, how do you know? Sound doctrine. All right. Now, throughout the book of Proverbs, you know what you'll find? You'll find the foolish and the wise. All right. You'll, you'll find the fool and, and you'll, you'll find the fool and the wise. The, the foolish and the, versus wisdom. You'll find laziness, the sluggard versus the, the, the industrious. You'll find these things all through that book. And what will happen is you'll go, okay, there's this versus this. That's what you have in this verse. You have a contrast between being drunk and and being filled with the Spirit of God. Look, you don't need to raise your hands, but have you ever been around someone that's drunk? They don't have control of themselves. And they lose, they lose you know, any sense of their space invaders. You ever, you know, been around someone that's drunk? <laughs> that, I don't like that. I'm like, get out of my space, you know. <laughs> Give me some room, man. I don't like it when you're sober, let alone when you're drunk. I like my space, you know. But when somebody's drunk, they don't have control of themselves, and they're just sort of all over the place. That, that is not the description, that should not be the description of the way a Christian lives their life. I, I've met some Christians that one week they believe this, next week they believe this, one week they're into this, next week they believe this, and they're just sort of all, one week we go to this church, one week we go to this church, one week, and they're just sort of all over the place. Can I say this? The Spirit of God is not in that. All right, it says, be not drunk with wine, where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit of God. Let me, let me give you some things. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. All right, we're going to look at some doctrinal things about this. And, and we'll get into some practical things as well. First Corinthians chapter number 12. The moment that you were saved. Now, Jesus Christ in uh, John chapter number 3 is talking to a religious man named Nicodemus. And uh, Jesus said what? You must be what? Born again. And he says you must be born of the water and of the spirit. That water birth is flesh. You learn that from the next verse. But that spirit birth is, is, is done by the Holy Spirit of God. So when you get saved, when you are, uh, and we use these terms interchangeably. I learned this a long time ago. Preachers use terms that they assume everybody else knows and not everybody else knows. It's like when I'm talking to a mechanic, they're like, you know, the flux capacitor, you know, is broke. And that's how uh, you, you laugh. When they're telling me something about the transmission, I'm like, that's all I hear, flux capacitor. I don't know what they're saying. All I hear is lots of money has to be spent right now. So in church sometimes, preachers will talk about sanctification. They'll talk about uh, being born again. And it's important for you to understand, born again and saved are identical terms in the Bible, all right? All right, so when we talk about being born again, when you are born of the Spirit of God and you place your faith in Jesus Christ, not all, only are you born again and the Spirit of God comes inside of you, but look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, and look, if you would, at verse number 12. For as the body is one... And hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized, notice this, into one body. Now I told you a long time ago, I've said it over and over and over and over and over, that it's very critical and very important that you don't automatically read the word water where you read the word baptism. Are you with me? And you also don't insert the word baptism where you read water. John 3 is the classic case. There are a lot of Christian denominations and some cults that take John chapter 3 where it talks about being born of the water and the Spirit. And they say, see that water? That's baptism. And that's not what it is. The next verse identifies what that water is. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. 
Let the Bible be the dictionary for you, right? The Bible is the best commentary on the Bible. By the way, I've got to do this because I know Brother uh, uh, Patrick likes dinosaurs. Did you read your Bible today? T-Rex can't reach his Bible. What's your excuse? <laughs> I think I'm going to wear that. I like that. Uh, but the, the, the point is, you're going through your Bible, you're reading these things about water. That's not always baptism. When you read about baptism, it's not always water being involved. All right? 1 Corinthians 12 has nothing to do with water baptism. All right? Or else, if it does, and what you end up teaching is the same doctrine that the Church of Christ, or what we would sometimes call Campbellites, teach, which is that when you get baptized, that's when you're saved. Guys, that is not when you're saved. All right, and, 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 and look, every church does things a little bit different. Every pastor is a little bit different, and not necessarily right or wrong. But as for me, let me tell you why. I, as a pastor, don't lead someone to Christ, and the next day throw them in the, in the baptismal waters. I want there to be some time in between. I want them to go, okay, I got saved here. I got baptized here. How many times have you talked to somebody, and you go, hey, are you saved? Yeah, I got baptized on this day and this day and this day. Have you ever happened to you? You know, and you, it, you, I want there to be a distinction between those events. Now, here's what you have to understand. Salvation is a point in time where you trust Christ your Savior and you're born again. All right? Baptism is supposed to be, a physical water baptism today, is supposed to be a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Romans 6. And no differently than, than he uh, was buried and he rose again, your old man was buried and you've been risen to walk in newness of life. You are identifying with Jesus Christ when you do that. All right? That said, they're separate events. However, there's a spiritual baptism that takes place the moment you get saved. All right? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I want you to see this. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, For by one Spirit, not water, for by one Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit of God, are we all baptized into one body. And that is not even just a reference to a local church. Look at this. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Guys, if this was a local church, then again, what you end up teaching is that physical baptism is what puts you in this body. There's no water mentioned in this passage. This is a spiritual transaction that takes place the moment you get saved. So understand this. When you're saved, are you saved this morning? All right, if you're saved, you know what you are? You have been, the moment you are saved, you are baptized in the Spirit of God. And the moment you were saved, something else took place. You were baptized in the Spirit of God, and baptism means uh, being immersed into something, all right? And so you were baptized in the Spirit of God, which means you were also filled with the Spirit of God. All right, but I, I need you to understand that because uh, God will never leave you, He seals you until the day of redemption, Ephesians 4, verse 30, you'll never lose the Spirit of God in your life. You'll never lose your salvation. That's a blessing. However, you can lose the filling of the Spirit of God when you fill yourself with more of you. Does that make sense? All right, uh, look at John chapter 3. Go there if you would real quickly. John chapter number 3. In any home, any individual Christian, any mom, any dad, any husband, any wife, any child that is a born-again believer in a home uh, needs to get a hold of that. John chapter 3, uh, look if you would at verse number, oh, let's see here. Verse 25, then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said to him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. In other words, Jesus is drawing a crowd, and he's drawing a bigger crowd than John the Baptist is drawing, and so they're getting nervous. They're typical Baptists. They're worried about having a church split, right? All right, look at uh, verse number, let's see here, uh, uh, 30, or verse number uh, 28. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, that's John speaking, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He was happy just knowing that people were being drawn to Christ. That's, that should be our testimony. <laughs> now look at verse 30, though. If you can get hold of verse 30 in your life, you'll get somewhere as a Christian. Now, you know what ends up happening? What ends up happening is you get saved, you get baptized in the Spirit, you're filled with the Spirit of God, and it's not that the Spirit of God ever leaves you, but boy, you can just suppress. And you know what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter number 4? Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. 
You know what happens when you grieve him? You just sort of sequester him. You just sort of push him into a corner. You, you, you basically say, okay, here's my habits. Here's my hobbies. Here's my music. Here's my entertainment. Here's my desires. Here's my pride. Here's my ego. Here's even my ministry sometimes. Holy Spirit of God, you just go in that corner. And you know what he does? He's a gentleman. He'll do that. But you're grieving him. And, and when the flesh has its way, and you need to get a hold of this, your flesh is not saved. All right, you say, oh my goodness, are you teaching me uh, some kind of crazy new doctrine? No, your flesh isn't saved until the rapture. 1 Corinthians 15, Romans chapter 8. And so you've got this person inside of you that is pushing back and fighting against everything that the Holy Spirit of God wants to do in your life. You know what's a blessing, though? The other day we went somewhere, I forget, we were maybe on the trip, uh, take the youth group to camp, and uh, we stopped somewhere. And uh, got sodas. I was saying, hey, uh, Bella, we're getting water. She goes, isn't it free refills? Can't we just get a soda? Because it's free refills, right, Dad? And I was like, okay, I think she's using teen logic here. But <laughs> like, can we buy money to get free refills? Can we use money to get free refills? And I was like, okay, whatever. But isn't it nice when you go to a restaurant and they have free refills? Amen. You know what it is with the Spirit of God? It's free refills. Amen. Listen, when you, when you push and you grieve and you uh, 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 compress the Holy Spirit of God in your life by the things that you allow in, by allowing your flesh to have free course in your home, can I say this? Anger and strife and contention and pride and ego, these are the things, listen, these are the things that are destroying Christian homes. Uh, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, listening to the preaching and understanding from the Word of God, even when you read the Bible, there are things that don't belong in your home, and then turning on the TV and just letting it flood your home. Or, you know, given, listen, parents, you do what you want with your kids. I'm not saying they can't have a phone. That, that's a, a decision between you and your child. But understand that there needs to be some kind of restrictions on this, or else they have everything at their fingertips, and that's not always a good thing. What I'm saying is there, there has to be some understanding that, that we, we can't just come to church. It's not just a matter of coming to church, getting the dose, and that fixes me for the rest of the week. No, in today's day and age, you need to be here every time the doors are open. But that's not sufficient for you. You need to determine in your own life that you're going to walk in the Spirit. That you're going to let the Holy Spirit of God lead you and not just the flesh. Here's some questions for you. How much time are you spending in the Word? How much time do you spend in prayer? How much time feeding the fleshly appetite versus the spiritual appetite in your home? How much uh, effort is being invested in growing as a Christian? Hey, listen, young people, that your parents are going to do everything they can to foster that, but you have to desire that for yourself. And let me say this. Uh, uh, husbands, your wife might go, Honey, come to church. Honey, come to church. Honey, read your Bible. Honey, do this. You've got to desire it for yourself, gentlemen. Uh, ladies, your husband can pray for you. You can get behind you, but you've got to desire this for yourself. How much restraint, I'll put it this way, are you putting on your flesh? Uh, you know, you've seen the Great Wall of China before. That's one of the one things you can actually see from outer space. When the NASA guys went up there, they could see part of the Great Wall of China. Pretty fascinating that that was built so long ago, and it can be seen from outer space. That Great Wall of China took hundreds of years. It took a long time to build that thing, and thousands of people built it, and all kinds of resources were poured into it. And you know all it took was somebody coming up to the wall and bribing the person that was there at the post to flood into China when the Mongols were coming. You say, what is that? That's a picture of your flesh. It's always there and can be easily bribed. Am I right about that? And you've got to learn to put a check on it. You've got to decide, I'm not going to speak that way anymore. I'm not going to yell at my kids anymore. I'm not going to disrespect my husband anymore. I'm not going to yell at my wife like she's a dog. I'm not going to treat her like a kid. These are things you've got to understand. It's not like, you know, you check out, and, and, you know, we come to church and, okay, we're happy. And you, and you go out there and, and you can just sort of change. It doesn't work that way. You need to understand that what you're, the Christian life is 24, is supposed to be 24-7. It is, okay, I, these are the things that I am putting on. I want to walk in the Spirit in every moment of my life. Here's some questions for you. Do we make excuses for outbursts? I was tired. Look, I understand we get tired. Hey, I am tired right now. I, I, I left Sunday and it has not stopped since I left. You know, you, you room with a bunch of boys and, you know, and it's late at night. Lights out. And, you know, they're talking and goofing off. And, and you know, and then eventually one of the counselors who will remain unnamed uh, goes out on a Wendy's run and, and buys, you know, uh, uh, French fries and hamburgers. And that keeps them up for another hour and a half, you know. And, 
And, uh, and, and by the way, I was preaching twice and I didn't have my messages completely ready. And so I'm staying up till God knows when driving and getting the kids down and getting up early to study and, and leading music there too. And, and I'm not complaining. It was a great time. Wonderful. But I'll tell you right now, I am physically exhausted, but I could not be happier to be in church. And I mean that. You say, why? Because I want the Spirit of God to lead me. I don't want my flesh to get its way all the time. Do we make room and provision for the devil through entertainment? Do we not restrain the flesh in our speech? Do we not restrain the flesh in our personal habits? Do we allow strife and contention in our home? Look at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. I want to show you another one of those contrasts, like I mentioned from the book of Proverbs. I think sometimes when it comes to the, the, the principles that are spiritual in nature, we tend to go, yeah, that's good for, you know, like soul winning and going to the mission field and, you know, uh, being a witness. Um, but you understand it touches every aspect of your life. It touches your communication with the people in your home. It, it touches the way that you deal with one another in your home. It touches the level of respect you have for one another. It should touch all of that. If the Spirit of God is leading you, all right, if the Spirit of God is leading you, you have to ask yourself, listen, there, there's a place in the Bible where, in the Gospels, where uh, Jesus is about to go into a, into, a, into a city. And you know what happens? The people from that city don't want him. That happens, right? You ever try to tell someone about the Gospel and you knock on a door, you, you talk to your coworker, and they shut you down. They, hey, I don't want to hear that stuff. I, I don't want to listen. To that. I, I don't want to talk about religion. I, just start, I don't want to hear about Jesus. Well, Jesus is coming to a town where they basically say, we don't want to hear about you. But stay out. And his disciples, uh, James and John, known as the sons of thunder, you know what their response was? They got down and said, Lord, we need to pray that God opens their hearts and God does something great. And Lord, would you please move? If you have not read your Bible, I'm lying to you right now. That is not what happened. You know what they said? Lord, can we call fire down from heaven and kill them? <laughs> you know what the Lord's response was? Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. And sometimes the way that you respond to rejection, the way you respond to conflict, proves that you're not really aware of which spirit is leading you right now. And you need to rein it back in and go back to the principles that you'll find in the Word of God that are associated with the person of the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, look at Galatians chapter 5, and look if you would at verse number 19. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. You say, why? You can see them. They're evident. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. I mean, so far, these are pretty bad things. Can we agree on that? All right, these are some pretty rough things here. But notice this, variance, emulations, wrath. Do you realize wrath shows up in the same line as adultery and fornication? Do you have control of your own spirit? Or do you fly off on a handle? Do you, do you basically say, it just takes one, someone just says one thing, all of a sudden you're like, ah! Listen, I understand sometimes we're tired, uh, things ha I get that, but at the same time, if, if you're not careful, and that becomes a habit in your life, something is wrong, you are not being led by the Spirit of God. Look, this is not a preacher that believes, if you do these things, you're not saved. I believe you're probably just as saved as everybody else. You're just not being led by the Spirit of God. And you have to step back and ask yourself, why am I responding this way? I challenge leaders in this church, people that teach Sunday school classes and, and help with VBS and, and, you know, whatever you're doing around here. I challenge people all the time, hey, when you get offended because somebody said something about how you did something, you've got to step back and go, look, okay, maybe they were a jerk about it, but I can smile knowing that Jesus Christ is pleased with my effort. When you get all bent out of shape and you're just one step away from blowing a gasket, you've got to ask yourself, who's leading right now? Uh, the old illustration is this. The old illustration is you've got two dogs that are getting ready for a fight. And Friday night, they're going to have a big fight between these two dogs. And over here, I talked to the boys about this the other day. And we're talking a little bit about music and what, what music will do for your spirit and how the wrong kind of music will do something wrong for you. And you got the, this dog over here, and you feed this dog, and you groom this dog, and you, 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 know, you massage the dog. They got dog massages now, and you know, they treat dogs better than people anymore. 
You know, you got all that you're taking really, you're pampering this dog and you're running with the dog every day and he's stretching and he, this one over here, you don't feed him all week, you keep him in the cage. You don't, you give him any nutrition, you barely give him any water. When that fight happens on Friday night, that dog's going to win. You say, why? That's the one you fed. There are decisions in your life that come to an apex and a climax and you see, oh, this is this huge decision. But all the while, leading up to that climax, there were all these smaller decisions like, who am I going to feed today? Am I going to feed my flesh? Am I going to feed the spirit? Uh, who, who am I going to give nutrition to? Who am I going to pamper, if you will? And if you don't do that with the spirit of God in your life, let me tell you, the flesh will take advantage. It mentions wrath. It mentions strife, seditions, heresies. You're saying heresy coming into the church is a work of the flesh? God's not in it? Envyings. Look at that, envy. Murder, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It doesn't say you're lost. It says you don't get the inheritance. There's a difference, all right? There's rewards that you lose out on when you allow the flesh to lead you. But look at verse 22. Look at the contrast. But the fruit. Now notice in verse number 19, you got the contrast of works versus fruit. This is why putting up a, a, a list of rules like, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do this. Rules are necessary. We're going to talk about that. But you can't become spiritual by rules. Because the flesh is what's associated with works. The Spirit of God is associated with fruit. Meaning when you draw nigh to God, He'll draw nigh to you, and you allow the Spirit of God in your own personal life and in your thoughts and in your heart, and even in the small things like, why am I doing this right now? Am I doing this to get noticed? Am I doing this for a pat on the back? Am I, and what, what is my purpose? I mean, guys, you may laugh at this, but whenever I'm doing something, you know, for my wife sometimes, I check it, and there are times when I've, I've done the wrong thing. You say, how? I did the right thing, but I did it just so I could be, look at me, I'm taking out the trash, baby. <laughs> I mean, really, there ought, there ought to be some checking of your motives. Why? Because if you don't do that in the small things, you'll never do it in the big things. And the flesh will always take advantage of that. He mentions the fruit of the Spirit. What is it? It's love. Isn't this what you want in your home? <laughs> this is a, a, hey, no place like home. You know what people want in this world? They want love. Look, I don't care if you talk to a guy that hates God, wants nothing to do with God. You know what that guy still wants? He wants love. He won't find real love outside of Jesus Christ. We know that. But notice the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's joy, peace, long-suffering. To me, guys, this sounds like home. This is what I want my home to be. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That means self-control. Against such there is no law. Look at the next verse. This is key in getting all of this. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live the Spirit, in other words, if you're saved, let us also walk in the Spirit. Guys, the whole idea is simply this. Look at uh, Romans chapter number 8 real quickly. Romans chapter 8. The idea is you have a choice. You have a choice to be led by the Spirit of God or to be led by your flesh. That is a choice that you make every single day. And that choice affects the people that live with you in that home. Listen, uh, uh, you know, summer camp was great. It was such a blessing. We're talking about that this morning. Um, and, and I, you know, a, the kids were like, we don't want to leave. We don't want to leave. But I'll tell you, on, on the other hand, uh, you can only take so much of living in a cabin with seven stinky boys. <laughs> All right, so, so what I'm getting at is this. When you live with somebody all the time, you see every single side of them. I set a precedent from day one. I had the boys in the back there, you know, getting ready for church, and I said, I got my, my body spray out. I said, bless you, my son. Bless you, my son. I'm doing this. And they're like, <laughs> you know, doing And then some of the kids had no idea what was going on, you know. But here's what ended up happening. I noticed my bottle was getting lighter and lighter. Some of these boys were just going, that was good, you know. And going in there, you say, well, I was setting a precedent. You know what you need to do in your home? You need to set a precedent for what's okay and what's not okay. In regards to not just, not just hey, we don't listen to this, we don't do this, but also, hey, that's not the right spirit. Listen, parents, when you tell your kids to do something, they're like, fine, I'll put my laundry away. Okay, that's where you sit down and have a conversation and go, look, I'm not making dinner for you that way. And you, but, you got, see, but you as a parent, you have to make sure you're doing the right thing too. 
You can't be like, I'm so tired, and you guys are ungrateful, and I just can't believe, I can't believe you guys never eat the food. That you got to learn to control yourself if you want them to do it. And what I'm getting at is you, you, there has to be an opportunity where everybody sees in this home, we work together, and we are all striving to follow the, the Spirit of God. Look at Romans 8 real quickly. I'm going to give you a principle here in just a moment. Romans 8, verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. You ever been around either a lost person or just a, even a carnal Christian? It just seems like you're talking to a brick wall, and you're like, man, listen, I, I've been around people that I used to like, go to church with years ago, and I, get to, I, I hang out with them again, and it's just like, man, what, what happened? I have nothing in common with you. If we took, a, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, you know the, the little time capsule back, and we went back in time, the DeLorean. We took the DeLorean back and, and went back there. You know what? We'd get along just fine. Why? We were on the same path, but eventually something happened. All right, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. That's why what you allow in your home sets a precedent for how you are going to allow the flesh or the spirit to be preeminent in your home. And you may, not think, you may not think these shows or these things that come through on the TV or the things that you listen to, you may not think they have a great effect, but there's a spirit in them. And that spirit drives the flesh. And if you're not careful and if you allow too much of that in your home, boy, the spirit of God just says, you know what? I can't be around this. I'm not going to be around this. I'm not leaving you, but I'm not feeling you either. Here's what I've learned. I heard this, and this is great. A spirit-filled believer will take what others are making big and will make them small. Get a hold of this. And a carnal Christian will take what others meant to be small and make them big. I literally have had this happen before. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. And after church, they text me and go, what do you mean by good to see you? <laughs> Bad to see you? Not good to see you? What would you like me to say? When someone is that touchy that it just takes the smallest thing and they just poof. You see, was it? they're taking something small and making it big. When you do that in your life and in your home, you're not being led by the Spirit of God. You're being led by your flesh. A spiritual person will take something. Look, guys, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. And at the end of that thing, I know that's a long process. By the end of that thing, you know what he says to them? He says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. That is the right mindset to have in our homes. And you might say, you don't know what they did to me. I'm pretty sure no one here has been sold into slavery by their family. I'm guessing, right? All right, so, so what I'm getting at is this, is that a spirit-filled person will not take things that are, could, you could take them and make them smaller. Instead of making them, oh, I can't believe this is going on. I can't believe this is happening. Oh, my goodness, what's going on? Listen, parents, can I say this? Your kids are growing up, and there are going to be times where they don't know how to handle things. You've got to be in control. You cannot lose it along with them. Husbands and wives, can I say it like this? There are times where... You know, there, someone's going to be a little bit more emotional than another person. And it's not always the females. Sometimes it's the guys, depending on what it is. Somebody has to step in and go, hey, 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 let's bring this back into control of the Holy Spirit. That's necessary. You know what that is? That is a home that is relying on the Spirit of God to lead them. Hey, hon, can you take care of this for me? Why? Why do I always have to be the one? Can I say when you use the words always and never, you're probably wrong? You know? You say, what is that? Flesh. It's your flesh. There's no spirit of God in that. And when you step back and you, if you could, look guys, let's just put it to you this way. If you had a camera that videotaped these kinds of conversations that you have sometimes in your home, and you'd watch it, you'd be like, man, that guy's a jerk. Yeah, that was you. <laughs> oh, I would never act that way. Well, I, I don't, I just, it was just the heat of the moment. Okay. Well, that heat of the moment showed that there was something in there that should have been dealt with a long time ago. Because if that heat of the moment thing happens and you say certain things and you act a certain way, it's in there. What is the Bible? Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it is important, for, again, for you to get a hold of this, that the Spirit of God, you must rely on the Spirit of God in your home or your home will not be a place. You know, you say no place like home. Listen, there are some homes there. There ain't no place like it, but it, no one wants to go there either. And that's not what we mean by no place like home, all right? Um, go to your Old Testament. Look at 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. There's a great example of this. And the great example of this is Saul in the Old Testament. Saul has everything, man. He's got the opportunity to become the greatest king that Israel ever had. 
You say, well, he's the first one. Yeah, he could have made it a lot different than it turned out. Uh, look at 1 Samuel chapter number 18. You say, what was his problem? His problem was he was led by his flesh. Uh, 1 Samuel 18, look if you would at verse number uh, 9. And saw I, David, from that day and forward. Verse 10. And it came to pass in the morrow that the evil spirit of God, from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as at other times. And notice this. And there was a javelin in Saul's hand. Now you may think that's an inconspicuous, small, innocuous, innocent little phrase. It's there for a reason. Look what he does in verse 11. <laughs> Can I say this? You can't, smite a you can't throw a javelin if you don't have one in your hand. Are you with me? If, you're, if you don't have some just ready for someone to get you upset, it's really hard to throw it if it ain't there. You know what the problem is? Flesh. Flesh. And Saul was constantly driven by what people think of him. If, let me tell you something that's gonna, it could destroy you. You may never drink. You may never smoke, dr do drugs. You may never allow any of this stuff in your home. You may have things very... Listen, I'll just use my home as an example if that's okay. You know, we don't do those things. Our kids are homeschooled. We try to keep our things separate from the world. All that stuff is wonderful. But with all of that there, I still have my flesh. With all of that on the outside of my home, my flesh is on the inside of that home. And if I'm not careful, as a father especially, I can just have that javelin there, and the kid does something, the kid spills something, the, you know, the kid says something wrong, and rather than going, how dare you? Have some respect for your dad. Listen, hey, did you, did you just hear what you just said? Yeah? Do you understand the problem with what you just said? Yeah? Okay, we need to sit down and talk about that. I tell you what, your kids probably fear more that than, ah! You know why? Because you're in control. And I've, I've watched parents, people that come to church that believe the right stuff doctrinally, and there's a disconnect between doctrine and application. And they understand what is right. But I've seen them, listen, I... I I'm trying to be very careful not to tell you what to do with your children because you're the parent. But at the same time, when I see a parent do this, come here. Can I tell you, you have already blown it. Yep. I don't care what your kid did. You've blown it. Right. You aren't in control. Whenever you're throwing stuff and you're slamming cabinets because you're upset at your husband or, you know, you're slamming a door, guys, because you're upset at her, you, you've blown it. You say, what? The flesh is now running the show. And then what ends up happening if you have kids is then you go to them and you go, hey, you can't do this. And they're looking at you going, why? You're doing it. Guys, this is the story of hundreds, if not thousands, of Christian homes in America today. You say, why? Because the flesh is leading the show. There needs to be a reliance on the Holy Spirit. God, look at uh, chapter 19, same book. Chapter number 19. Chapter number 19, look if you would at verse number 9. And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul. Now there's some doctrinal stuff here that I can't get into with this evil spirit of the Lord and all that. This is Old Testament. Understand uh, this. Understand the spirit of God uh, will never leave you if you're saved today. And what you have with Saul is you've got a situation in the Old Testament that's different than today where it literally says in another passage of Scripture that the Spirit of God departed from him and an evil spirit of the Lord came on him. All right? However, that said, there is a parallel in this. The flesh is running the show. Look at uh, verse number 9. As he sat in his house with his javelin. Why are you always sitting? I mean, what kind of guy sits around with a javelin in his hand? I mean, that's a little weird. Does anybody ask the question, why is he doing that? And, and, and honestly, spiritually, some Christians sit around with a javelin in their hand, just waiting for someone to offend them, just waiting for someone to mess up so they can nail them to the wall in Jesus' name. Let me say this. You're not nailing them to the wall in Jesus' name. You're doing it in your name and it's in the flesh. Look at verse number 10. And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence and he smote the javelin in the wall and David fled and escaped that night. Look at chapter number 20. Chapter number 20. Look at uh, chapter 20 and verse number 30. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. Why not? He's just, he's always angry. He's like Hulk. You know, that's my secret. I'm always angry. That's how some people are. You know, I'm just always waiting for someone to get me upset. And when they do, I'm going to show them, you know, and by the way, that is not something to be proud about. 
People go, you know what? Don't cross me because you'll see another side of me. That, that's foolish to talk that way. Right. You gain no one's respect. You don't gain a respectable person's respect. I'll say it that way. And you don't gain the respect of the people in your home. Look, at Saul is, is angry, and he's always angry. His anger is now kindled. It's, it's a matter of who is he going to be angry with at this time, right? Uh, look, if you would, at verse, uh, again, verse number 30. Thou son of the perverse, rebellious woman, do not I know that thou hast chosen the, thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion, and under the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. You know what Saul's wonder, worried about himself and establishing his own kingdom? He doesn't care about his son. If he cared about his son, he wouldn't talk to him the way he did. It's all about him. Look down, if you would, at verse number uh, 32. And Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and said to him, I don't know, guys. I don't see a lot of disrespect here. I, I see respect. Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him, his own kid. His own kid. You say, why? He couldn't control himself. You do a lot of damage when you can't control your flesh. And when the Spirit of God is not leading you, and the Spirit of God is not filling you because you are too full of self. And if our home is going to be a place like no other place, no place like home, there has to be reliance on the Holy Spirit of God. It cannot be a free-for-all with the flesh. And I'll, I'll say it again. I don't want to just keep uh, uh, beating a dead horse uh, but, but the truth of the matter is, you can't ask of your children for them to do something that you're not setting forth the example to do. You've got to lead, parents. Husbands, can I say this? You've got to lead. Ladies, can I say this? You need to follow his lead. And you need to understand that it is important. It is not just important. It is critical to the life of your home that you are filled with the Spirit of God and led by the Spirit of God. Go back to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. There needs to be a reliance on the Spirit of God. You know what? Can I say this? God never tells you to do something that you can't do. So you know what you have here in Ephesians 5? You know what you have in the Bible? How about this? Be holy for I am holy. Well, I can't be holy. Yeah, you can. It doesn't say sinless. It says holy. There's a desire for the things of God. That should be a part of your life and a part of your character as a Christian. He says here in Ephesians chapter 5, I believe because he knows you can do it, be not drunk with wine where in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, I don't think it's a coincidence. I'm going to close with this. Look at verse 19. I don't think it's a coincidence that music is associated with being filled with the Spirit of God. And let me challenge everybody here today, what kind of music, when you get in your car and drive away, and you get to your house, and you are jogging in the morning with your buds in, or whatever the case might be, look at verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You say, what is that? You want the Spirit of God around? You've got to fill, you got to make the environment right. I'll tell you one of the things that I appreciated about... Uh, camp this year was we were able to do it and it's not a, a, it, it's just different from where we were last year geographically they didn't have the, the facilities to do this where we were at last year so it's not a slam it's just the way it was but we were able to be in an air-conditioned building and so right you can say amen to that it is nice to have you know heating and air conditioning and and so you know what was really hard to do last year when it got really hot in that that second level loft of that barn structure we were in it was hard to stay awake and at the end of the day, when you're tired and sweaty and it's hot and it's 90 degrees outside, and boy, you say, what happens? Well, you know, what's important to do in any area of life is to set the environment, make the environment what it needs to be, facilitate the environment for what it is that you want to get done. Do you know why it's important to, to be modest as a Christian? You're setting the environment around you, ladies especially, all right? Uh, I, I would say this. I would say for the most part, ladies fall in love with what they hear. Not that you ladies aren't attracted physically. I get that you are. But guys really struggle with what they look at. Ladies, it is important to be modest. Why? You're setting the precedent for everything that goes on around you that this is the kind of woman I am for the Lord. Amen, Amen. Amen preacher. That's good preaching. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, but the point is this, you've got to set the mood. You've got to set the mood. Listen, guys, you take your wife on a date. Chick-fil-A is not exactly what I mean by that. 
All right, you might set a flower, they might be Valentine's Day, they might put a flower there, but I mean, you know, you set the mood. You go to a, a nice fancy restaurant, they light the candle, and you're, gla you're just glazing over each other and holding hands and looking at each other's eyes, and oh, it's like we're falling in love all over again. And we're talking about when we first met. You say, what's that? You're setting the mood. Listen, when you come to church and we have the music that we have and the things that we have here, what are you doing? We're setting the mood. We're getting everything ready for the Word of God to go out and hopefully effectually work also in you that believe. When you leave this place, you don't take off the Christian garment, spiritually speaking, and go home to your normal life. The home should be an extension of everything that you nod to or hopefully nod to and say amen to. You say, what is that? Being led by the Spirit of God. Relying on the Spirit of God. And that's, that's, that's the other R. We talk about respect. Today we talked about reliance on the Holy Spirit of God. And can I say this? I believe that's something that we can do. Well, my home's not perfect and none of us can be. I, we're not talking about perfection. We're just talking about striving towards a goal. Having a goal of being a Spirit-filled believer and having a Spirit-filled home. Next week, we'll talk about the home being a place of roles, and after that, a place of rules, and after that, a place of relationship. All right.